Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is entitled Deuteronomy and the Later Writings. This is lesson number 11 in our series for December 11 of 2021. It's entitled uh, Deuteronomy and the Later Writings, we already mentioned. We usually begin with a prayer, word, with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, as we consider the implications of this book so written so long ago by Moses, may we understand what it means and, and think of the implications of what it tells us about inspiration and how you operate working through your inspired prophets is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. When we pick up a copy of the Bible in whatever language, we tend to think of it as a single book. However, in actual fact, it is a collection of 66 books composed over 1,500 years by many different authors in different languages. We believe that God ultimately was the author behind each of the uh, prophetic and apostolic messages. This is a challenge for our understanding if we truly believe that God was the author and yet it was written down by human individuals. How do we explain the language? Shouldn't God have used the same ideas that he used in earlier writings um, if the same problems came up later? How many times have you had to tell your children do not to do certain things so that they, would not they were not supposed to do? In the scripture, each time some point is covered, the context is different and thus the wording might be a bit different. And that causes some challenges. But as you might expect, later writers would also would ask people to look back to what the former writers had said in a given situation. It should not be a surprise then that creation, the flood, the exodus, and the giving of the Ten Commandments, and the other laws from Mount Sinai would be mentioned repeatedly by later prophets and apostles. We might expect that different aspects of the creation story would be mentioned many times in later writings, and of course it is. In our discussion of the book of Deuteronomy, we would expect that Moses would try to summarize what they should have learned to that point. Remember, we're talking about Moses on the plains of Moab, across the flooded Jordan River from Jericho, ready to ford that river and go into the Promised Land. He's giving his final messages. There, there are three separate sermons and a kind of an appendix some people call that the fourth sermon, but I think it's more like an appendix in the book of Deuteronomy. Then, after talking about what they had been through, he concluded by mentioning a number of things that they should do in the future to avoid further problems. Obviously, these points would be emphasized at later times when people fell into those specific problems. A classic example in scriptures is the story of King Josiah of Judah. He became king at eight years of age and reigned for 31 years from about 640 B.C. to 609 B.C. Something quite remarkable happened to him 18 years into his reign. Jim? 2 Kings 22, verses 3 to 20. In the 18th year of his reign, King Josiah sent the court secretary Shaphan, the son of Azaliah and grandson of Methuselah, no, Meshulam, to the temple with the order. Shaphan delivered the king's order to Hilkiah, and Hilkiah told him that he had found the book of the law in the temple. Hilkiah gave him the book, and Shaphan read it. Then he went back to the king and reported, Your servants have taken the money that was in the temple and have handed it over to the men in charge of the repairs. And then he said, I have here a book that Hilkiah gave me, and he read it aloud to the king. I'm going to interrupt for a second. We, we don't have too many interruptions because this is a long lesson. But that document that he found there, do you think it could be 400 years old, 500, 600 years old? Actually, if it went from all the way from Moses to Josiah, that would be 800 years. Not unreasonable. Yeah. And it wasn't a book like we think of a book. It was it's probably a, a rolled up scroll. Yeah. Go ahead. Then the king heard the book being read. He tore his 
close in dismay and gave the following order to Hilkiah the priest in Ahikim, son of Shaphan, and Akbor, son of Micaiah, to Shaphan, the court secretary, and to Asiah, the king's attendant. Go and consult the Lord for me and for all the people of Judah about the meanings of this book. The teachings. The teachings of this, excuse me. The Lord is angry with us because our ancestors have not done what this book must says must be done. Hilkiah, Achik, Achbor, Shaphan, and Asiah went to consult a woman named Hulda, a prophet who lived in the newer part of Jerusalem. Her husband, Shalom, the son of Tikva and grandson of Horus, was in charge of the temple, go- temple robes. And they described to her what had happened, and she told them to go back to the king and give him the following message from the Lord. I am going to punish Jerusalem, and all its people is written in the book that the king has read. The men returned to King Josiah with with this message. American Bible Society, 1992, Good News Translation. After having carefully studied the book of Deuteronomy in our series of lessons, it should be easy for us to recognize that scholars have often concluded that the scroll that was found in the temple complex in Josiah's day was the scroll of the book of Deuteronomy. There were some very clear directions given in Deuteronomy about what should happen to kings and other leaders of Judah and Israel in later history. Why weren't these in, those instructions followed? Carrie? Speaking from Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 18 through 20. When he becomes king, he is to have a copy of the book of God's laws and teachings made from the original copy kept by the Levitical priests. He is to keep this book near him and read from it all his life so that he will learn to honor the Lord and to obey faithfully everything that is commanded in it. This will keep him from thinking that he is better than his fellow Israelites and from disobeying the Lord's commands in any way. Then he will reign for many years and his descendants will rule Israel for many generations. And that's from the Good News Bible. Wow. Just imagine how different the story of the children of Israel would be if every king had followed those directions. Or Just, any king before Josiah. Yeah. Well, Hezekiah may have. Um, I don't and know. David did? I, I think probably David did. We, we, uh, we don't know for sure. Well, after hearing the book of Deuteronomy read to him, Josiah determined to follow God's will for the children of Israel as closely as possible. Myra? Second Kings 23.3. He stood by the royal column and made a covenant with the Lord to obey him, to keep his, com- his laws and commands with all his heart and soul, and to put into practice the demands attached to the covenant. As written in the book, all and all the people promised to keep the covenant. Good News Bible. Now let's picture that, if you will, for a moment. There were two huge columns out in front of the temple. And... And, of course, everybody who wanted to come in, to get into, in, inside the temple courtyard and so forth, would have to come past one of those columns. So if you wanted to make some kind of announcement to the public, especially if the king wants to say something, he stands by those columns as people are coming in, and he makes an announcement, and people hear, and so forth, like this. And here, in this case, Josiah says, we are going to follow the God's will, we're going to follow the directions given by in, in this book that we have just discovered in the temple, and everybody said, okay. Remember back at the foot of Mount Sinai? Yeah, it sounds All that the like Lord has said we will, we will do. do. It sounds scary. It sounds like he was a politician. <laughs> well, he was trying to do what was right. Still. How successful was Josiah at cleaning up the mess? Second Kings 23, 19 through 20. In every city of Israel, King Josiah tore down all the pagan places of worship, which had been built by the kings of Israel, who thereby aroused the Lord's anger. So this is a king of Judah going up to Israel, what had been Israel, and tearing down 
by this temples. time, yeah, by right. this time, the, there was no kingdom of Israel. It had yeah. been overrun by the Syrians and completely, con completely destroyed after s sieging uh, uh, the capital, Samaria, for about three years and so forth. And they had put their people in there. And if you remember what happened, they mixed up, of course, even before, Israel was overrun. It had a huge mess of. I mean, this was this is the this was the country that was originally ruled by uh, Ahab and Jezebel. So there was a huge mixture of pagan religions with some truth and so forth like this. And then when the Assyrians came in, there was even more junk mixed in. And so uh, Josiah says, "I'm going to go up there and I'm going to clean things up." And that's what became the Samaritans. That's what Jews became hated. Samaritans. Continuing Second Kings, he did to all those altars what he had done in Bethel. He killed all the pagan priests on that on the altars where they served, and he burnt human bones on every altar. Then he returned to Jerusalem. Under Josiah, the temple in Jerusalem was repaired and purified. It had gotten so bad that you know people didn't weren't even coming there to worship. All all the pagan Canaanite and Assyrian isles were removed. Notice that. The, they're, they're, well, I mean, you can read about it. If we were studying Ezekiel now, you remember he was carried in vision to a place where the, a, a room, one of the rooms in the temple itself was full of pagan, pagan idols. What did the Assyrian rulers over the northern kingdom have to say about that? That's an interesting thing we don't know anything about. It is important to remember the history behind the campaign of Josiah. First of all, notice that Josiah was a king of Judah, as Gordon just mentioned, and he was killing all the pagan priests in the former northern kingdom of Israel. Those were the priests that had been set up by Jeroboam right after Israel split off from Judah as a united kingdom of Israel divided into two nations. But the northern kingdom of Israel had been conquered and destroyed by the Assyrians about 100 years before the days of Josiah. In Josiah's day, Israel was a vassal nation to the Assyrians. So how do you think the people of Northern Territory that had formerly been the country of Israel felt as Josiah appeared from Judah and traveled to their land, destroying their pagan altars and temples? And where did most of those people come from? You remember what the Assyrians did? The Assyrians took everybody they could get their hands on in Israel and scattered them out through their territory. And then they brought people out there that, been, that had been displaced and brought them here to, to, to settle Israel, what used to be the former nation of Israel. So here's this guy from the south showing up, just wiping out all the stuff, all their, I mean, how would we feel if someone came charging through our country and destroyed all the Christian churches? So that was the original melting pot. Something like that. Uh, he, the Assyrians brought all people from, mixed people from all different yep. territories into one and all over the country. Nothing new under the sun, is there? <laughs> well, most, most nations keep to themselves, and they did back what's, then especially. What's going on in the world today? Yeah, well, especially here. Well, it, it, Europe has been yeah. Uh, yeah. suffering this for a long time. What kind of authority did Josiah have over that territory? Those were the early Samaritans. There's a crucial story connected with this campaign of Josiah, which has been, had been re predicted. 1 Kings 13, 1 to 32, and I'm gonna run through this story pretty quickly. Now we're, we're, we're jumping back about, um, let me see, that would have been about 300 years. Yeah, about 300 years back, this, this is what happened in 1 Kings 13. At the Lord's command, a prophet from Judah, this is, sounds familiar, doesn't it? Went to Bethel, that's one of the sub-capitals of the northern kingdom, and arrived there as Jeroboam stood at the altar to offer the sacrifice. Following the Lord's command, the prophet denounced the altar. Oh, altar, altar, this is what the Lord says. A child whose name will be Josiah, notice this, this is 300 years before Josiah, will be born to the family of David. He will slaughter on you the priests serving at the pagan altars who offer sacrifices on you, and he will burn human bones on you. We just read that that's exactly what he did. And the prophet went on to say, this altar will fall apart and the ashes on it will be scattered. Then you will know that the Lord has spoken through me. So here's this king, Jeroboam, coming down to the southern part of his kingdom, 
where he's just built a new temple and a new altar and so forth, and the huge crowd, the nations all gathered around. We're celebrating this new temple we've set up and so forth. And look at this. Here comes this guy from the south and makes all these predictions. And this story is right after the kingdom split. Right. Jer uh, the son of Solomon. Rehoboam. Rehoboam. And Jeroboam basically split the kingdom in two. Yeah. When King Jeroboam heard this, this this younger prophet making his prediction, he pointed at him and ordered, seize that man. At once the king's arm became paralyzed so that he couldn't pull it back. The altar suddenly fell apart. That was what was predicted. And the ashes spilled on the ground. That was predicted as the prophet had predicted in the name of the Lord. King Jeroboam said to the prophet, please pray for me to the Lord your God and ask him to heal my arm. Notice, to the Lord in small caps, that's in Hebrew, Yahweh. So pray to your God to fix my arm. The prophet prayed to the Lord and the king's arm was healed. Then the king said to the prophet, come home with me and have something to eat. I will reward you for what you have done. The prophet answered, even if you gave me half your wealth, I would not go with you or eat or drink anything with you. The Lord has commanded me not to eat or drink a thing and not to return home the same way I came. So he did not go back the same way he had come, but by another road. What's the reason for the man not having supper or a meal with the king, with King Jeroboam? Well, I mean, obviously, you can ask the good Lord that when you get to heaven. He's the one who ultimately will know. Probably the idea was that if he had gone to eat with him, it would have been, well, what the, the prophet's predictions weren't that serious. You know, this new king is probably okay. Everything's okay, mm -hmm. since the prophet had, would, would have had a meal with the king. Yeah. Okay. At that time, story goes on, there was an old prophet living in Bethel. Now we're going to assume, based on what's it's saying, that this was a true prophet, but he's living in the very pagan northern kingdom of Israel. His sons came and told him what the prophet from Judah had done in Bethel that day. He's living right there where all this happened, and what he had said to King Jeroboam. Which way did he go when he left? The old prophet asked, to, asked them. They showed him the road, and he told them to saddle his donkey for him. They did so, and he rode off down the road after the prophet from Judah and found him sitting under an oak. Big mistake. Are you the prophet from, 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 prophet from Judah, he asked. I am, the man answered. Come home and have a meal with me, he said. But the prophet from Judah answered, I can't go home with you or accept your hospitality, and I won't eat or drink anything with you here, because the Lord has commanded me not to eat or drink a thing and not to return home the same way I came. Then the old prophet from Bethel said to him, I too am a prophet just like you, and at Yahweh's, that's the, that's the, the, the real God, that's his name, at the Lord's command an angel told me, now, I mean, here's God speaking through an angel to me. I mean, what more authority do you need, right? The truth. Uh, told me to take you home with me and offer you my hospitality. But the old prophet was lying. Okay, what should have happened next? The young prophet should have uh, said a prayer. She young said... You, you have one, a, a newer instruction, I have an older instruction. Let's ask God which, which way I should go. Yeah, he certainly God should have cons never changes consulted, his mind. consulted God. So the prophet from Judah went home with the old prophet and had a meal with him. As they were sitting at the table, the word of the Lord came to the old prophet and he cried out to the prophet from Judah, the Lord says that you disobeyed him and did not do what he commanded. Instead, you returned and ate a meal in a place he had ordered you not to eat in. Because of this, you will be killed and your body will not be buried in your family grave. Wow. Real hospitality. The old prophet says, you didn't obey God because I told you to do something else. Because yep. that's what I said God had, had said. Maxwell used to t remember yeah. tell the story. He says, well, he got off his donkey and looked at the bumper sticker and just says, God, if God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. After they had finished eating, 
the old prophet saddled the donkey for the prophet from Judah. So he says, here, take my donkey, who rode off. On the way, a lion met him and killed him. Now, I've lived in East Africa long enough to know that the rest of this story is completely crazy. His body lay on the road, and the donkey and the lion stood beside it. This is total, I mean, obviously God is in control here. This has nothing to do with normal animal behavior. Some men passed by and saw the body on the road with a lion standing nearby. They went on into Bethel and reported what they had seen. When the old prophet heard about... What are you implying by that? Are you implying that the lion should have eaten either the donkey or the man? Or both. Or mauled them? Or both? Yeah, sure. Or run away? Yes. They shouldn't, they shouldn't all be there together? They should not have been there standing together. So God or the angel miraculously did that? Closed the mouths of the lions. Does that sound familiar? When, okay, when the old prophet heard about it, he said, that is the prophet who disobeyed the Lord's command. And so the Lord sent the lion to attack and kill him just as the Lord said he would. Then he said to his son, saddle my donkey. This must be a second donkey for me. They did so, and he rode off and found the prophet's body lying on the ground with the donkey and the lion still standing by it. So he went over and petted the lion, right? Yeah. <laughs> wow. The lion had not eaten the body or attacked the donkey. So obviously the author recognized this is strange behavior. The old prophet picked up the body, put it on the donkey, and brought it back to Bethel to mourn over it and bury it. He buried it in his own family grave, and he and his sons mourned over it, saying, Oh, my brother, my brother. Whew. After the burial, the prophet said to his sons, When I die, bury me in this grave and lay my body next to his. The words that he spoke at the Lord's command against the altar in Bethel and against all the places of worship in the towns of Samaria will surely come true. And we are, our, our lesson really is about how it came true. So what's the lesson that we're supposed to get from this story? Well, clearly the lesson is if someone stands up and says, the Bible says this or this, we have to check it out. We have to check it out. You can't just accept anyone's, I mean, if we could jump over to Revelation 13, not 1 Kings 13, but Revelation 13, the devil is going to come down with a whole army full of people who are going to go out and spread all kinds of lies and the whole world is going to be deceived. Saying that they have a message from God. Exactly. Do we hear any preachers today saying, I have a message from God, I'm getting a message right now? And, and, and I can heal you and prove it, all that yeah. kind of stuff. What a dangerous deception. Just because someone claims to be bringing truth from God does not mean that we do not need to check it out before believing it. We must always verify new information and compare with what God has told us in the past, that is, through the Bible. This story took place about 300 years before the days of Josiah. Jeroboam ruled from about 931 B.C. to 910 B.C. and Josiah lived from 640 to 609 B.C. So you can do your math there. Could any of our churches today need that kind of cleansing? Hmm. Should, Look, should their bodies be burned on the uh, pulpit? <laughs> Look at how detailed this instruction was as given to the children of Israel under Moses. Isn't that what's happening in, in Afghanistan and Iran and yep. a few other places? Yeah. Deuteronomy 12, excuse me, uh, Deuteronomy 10 verses 12 to 15. Now people of Israel, listen to what the Lord has, your God demands of you. Worship the Lord and do all his commandments. Love him, serve him with all your heart and they and obey all his laws. I am giving them to you today for your benefit. To the Lord belong every, excuse me, even the highest heavens. The earth is his and the everything on it. But the Lord loves, but the Lord's love for your ancestor was so strong that he chose you instead of any other people and you are his chosen people. Good News Bible. God's universe involves everything that has ever been created or exists. What we're saying is nobody else has the power to create. We do not know exactly what the prophets had in mind when they said heaven of heavens. That's in the King James Version. But it is very clear that it includes at least God's dwelling place on high. 
what did Jeremiah, now we're not, we're going from Jeroboam to Jeremiah, what did Jeremiah have to say about Deuteronomy and the ideas from that book? Carrie? Speaking from chapter 29 from Jeremiah and verses 13. You will seek me and you will find me because you will seek me with all your heart. Comes from the Good News Bible. Jeremiah clearly knew about the writings of Moses. Deuteronomy 4, 27 to 30, the Lord will scatter you among other nations where only a few of you will survive. There you will serve gods made by human hands, gods of wood and stone, gods that cannot see or hear, eat or smell. There you will look for the Lord your God, and if you search for him with all your heart, you will find him. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Yeah. Quoted almost verbatim by Jeremiah. Go ahead. When you are in trouble and all those things happen to you, then you will finally turn to the Lord and obey him. He is a merciful God. He will not abandon you or destroy you, and he will not forget the covenant that he himself made with your ancestors. From the Good News Bible. We need to remember that Jeremiah was a young man who was born and raised just about exactly the same time as King Josiah that we've been reading about. What else did Jeremiah say? Jeremiah 7, 1 to 7. The Lord sent me to the gate of the temple where the people of Judah went to worship. He told me to stand there and announce what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, had to say to them. Change the way you are living and the things you are doing, and I will let you go on living here. Stop believing those deceitful words. We are safe. This is the Lord's temple. This is the Lord's temple. This is the Lord's temple. Change the way you are living and stop doing the things you are doing. Be fair in your treatment of one another. Stop taking advantage of aliens, orphans, and widows. Stop killing innocent people in this land. Stop worshiping other gods, that, for that will destroy you. If you change, I will let you go on living here in the land which I gave to your ancestors as a permanent possession. Good News Bible. Wow. Think of how many times we've already noted in Deuteronomy that God told the children of Israel that they were not just supposed to follow the religious ceremonies that he instructed them to do, but they were supposed to be fair to the orphans, the widows, the foreigners among them, and always be fair to all those they dealt with in business. Unfortunately, in Jeremiah's day, shortly before Nebuchadnezzar arrived and destroyed Jerusalem, three different times in the temple completely, the people got the idea that somehow God's temple would be preserved miraculously. So they thought that if they stayed close to the temple, they would be protected. God's temple was never meant to be a good luck charm. And I can tell you, even after the days of Jesus in AD 70, when it was a Roman army attacking, almost exactly the same story. People thought, okay, they, they would crammed into the temple hoping that somehow or other the temple would be preserved. And they would be preserved. And they would be preserved, obviously. Remember how many times it says in Deuteronomy that they were supposed to care for the fatherless, the widow, and the orphans? Several times. This yeah. First from Deuteronomy 24, 21. When you have gathered your grapes once, do not go back over the vines a second time. The grapes that are left are for the foreigners, orphans, and widows. Sounds a little bit like Ruth. Mm hmm Very much like Ruth. Deuteronomy 10, 18 and 19, He, that is God, makes sure that orphans and widows are treated fairly. He loves the foreigners who live, out, live with our people and gives them food and clothes. So then, show love for those foreigners because you were once foreigners in Egypt. And from Deuteronomy 27, 19, God's curse on anyone who deprives foreigners, orphans, and widows of their rights. All from the Good News Bible. Yeah. And there's just, I mean, there's more places, but there's just three outstanding examples from the Code Deuteronomy from Moses back as they were setting up, they were about to set up their government in the new land. Be, be fair to foreigners, be fair to widows, be fair to orphans. Well, now is a challenging question I'm asking you. 
how successful would the Adventist church be in our day if we carefully followed the instructions given in Deuteronomy? Well, Are you suggesting that we don't? Well, I'll let you think about that. Well over 100 years ago, Alan White said on several occasions that we should have been in the kingdom of heaven before this. Would that be true if we had followed the instructions in the book of Deuteronomy alone, even if we didn't have anything else? Many of the later prophets understood the need for reform very clearly. Micah 6, one day, listen to the Lord's case against Israel. Arise, O Lord, and present your case. Let the mountains and the hills hear what you say. You mountains, you everlasting foundations of the earth, listen to the Lord's case. The Lord has a case against his people. He's going to bring an accusation against Israel. The Lord says, my people, what have I done to you? How have I been a burden to you? Answer me, I brought you out of Egypt. I rescued you from the slavery. I sent Moses, Aaron, and Miriam to lead you. My people, remember what King Balak of Moab planned to do to you and how Balaam, son of Beor, answered him. Remember the things that happened on the way from the camp at Acacia to Gilgal. Remember these things and you will realize what I did in order to save you. What shall I bring to the Lord? He goes on. The God of heaven, when I come to worship him, shall I bring the best calves to burn his offerings to him? Will the Lord be pleased if I bring him thousands of sheep or endless streams of olive oil? Shall I offer my, him my firstborn child to pay for my sins? No, the Lord has told us what is good. What he requires of us is this, to do what is just, to show constant love, and to live in humble fellowship with our good, uh, with our God, I'm sorry, the Good News Bible. In effect, in this passage, God was bringing a lawsuit against his people. In effect, he was saying, we had an agreement. You agreed. What happened? It is important to notice that Micah borrowed words almost directly from Deuteronomy. Jim? Deuteronomy 10, verses 12 to 13. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. King James Version, 1982, Deuteronomy 10. Unfortunately, the people had deteriorated into following a kind of letter of the law and completely ignoring the spirit of the law. I'm basically, what they've described there, they weren't even listening to the letter of the law. Yeah. Notice this commentary note on Micah 6, 1 to 8. Carrie? Uh, yeah, just, where is that? This is one of the great passages of the Old Testament. It, like Amos 5, 24, and... Uh, Hosea? It? What's Hoss? Hosea. 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 Oh, okay, 6, 6. Epitomizes the message of the 8th century prophets. The passage opens with a beautiful example of a covenant lawsuit in which the prophet summons the people to hear the charge Yahweh has against them. The mountains and the hills are the jury because they have been around a long time and have witnessed God's dealing with Israel. Rather than directly charging Israel with breaking the covenant, God asks Israel if they have any charges against him. What have I done? How have I wearied you? In the face of injustice, some of the poor people may have become, quote, weary and well-doing, unquote. In face of the opportunities to get rich, some quick some of the landowners might have grown weary of keeping the covenant laws. It's from Ralph Smith, World Biblical Commentary. Yeah. And... So when they had to make a choice between making a quick buck and following God's directions, which do they do? Making lots of quick bucks. Making lots of quick bucks. What happened to that promise from Deuteronomy 4, verse 6? Myra? Deuteronomy 4, verse 6. Obey them faithfully, and this will show the people of other nations how wise you are. When they hear of all these laws, they will say, what wisdom and understanding this great nation has. Good news, Bible. Have we ever heard that? 
Yeah, what about that? It was not only the book of Deuteronomy that was quoted by later prophets. Daniel was prime minister in Babylon and later in Medo-Persia, no doubt had access to as many as the scrolls as were available. We know from the story found in Daniel 6 that Daniel regularly prayed to God three times a day with his window open toward Jerusalem and ended up in the lion's den, right? We do not know exactly under what circumstances the prayer recorded in Daniel 9, 1 to 19 was prayed. However, notice these very significant words. So from Daniel 9, starting with verse 5, we have sinned, this is Daniel's prayer, mm -hmm. we have sinned, we have been evil, we have been wrong, we have rejected what you commanded us to do, and have turned away from what you showed us was right. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our rulers, our ancestors, and our whole nation. You, Lord, always do what is right, but we have always brought disgrace on ourselves. This is true of all of us who live in Judea and in Jerusalem, and of all the Israelites whom you scattered in countries near and far because they were unfaithful to you. Our kings, <clears throat> our rulers and our ancestors have acted shamefully and have sinned against you, Lord. You are merciful and forgiving, although we have rebelled against you. We did not listen to you, O Lord our God, when you told us to live according to the laws which you gave us through your servants the prophets. All Israel broke your laws and refused to listen to what you said. We sinned against you. And so you brought on us the curses that are written in the law of Moses, your servant. You did what you said you would do to us and our rulers. You punished Jerusalem more severely than any other city on earth, giving us all the punishment described in the law of Moses. But even now, O Lord our God, we have not tried to please you by turning from our sin or by following your truth. You, O oh Lord our God, were prepared to punish us, and you did, because you always do what is right, and we do not listen to you. O oh Lord our God, you showed your power by bringing your people out of Egypt, and your power is still remembered. We have sinned, we have done wrong, you have defeated us in the past. So defended. You have defended us in the past, so do not be angry with Jerusalem any longer. It is your city, your sacred hill. All the people in the neighboring countries look down on Jerusalem and on your people because of our sins and the evil our ancestors did. I'm going to interrupt for just a second. God has obviously allowed them to be taken into captivity and all that kind of stuff. Were they really more evil than the nations around them? Or was the problem just that they were not supposed to be like that at all? They were supposed to be better. I suspect that they were like the other nations and just they had a higher standard. Mm -hmm. They had more knowledge of God and should have been way up here when yep. they were at the same level or below their neighbors. Yep. Verse 17, O God, hear my prayer and pleading. Restore your temple which has been destroyed. We restore it so that everyone will know that you are God. Listen to us, O God, look at us, and see the trouble we are in and the suffering of the city that bears your name. We are praying to you because you are merciful, not because we have done right. Lord, hear us. Lord, forgive us. Lord, listen to us and act in order that everyone will know that you are God. Do not delay. This city and these people are yours. So the Good News Bible. Yeah, what is, Dan, what is Daniel praying for? It's very significant to notice in Daniel 5 through 19 that repeatedly Daniel essentially said, as he was speaking to God, God, it is your power that people remember. You defended us in the past. Jerusalem is your city, your sacred hill. Restore your temple. This city bears your name. We are praying to you because you're merciful, not because we have done right. Lord, hear us. Lord, forgive us. Lord, listen to us and act in order that everyone will know that you are God. Do not delay. This city and these people are yours. In other words, what's he praying for? 
He's praying for God's reputation. He's realizing they, the whole country had sinned and he was including himself there. He wasn't trying to be, you know, some lorded over them in some way. He knew they had all been faithful. Then they had done virtually everything wrong that God had warned them again about. But he turned to God and in essence said, God, you need to do something for your own reputation's sake. It is your city, your sacred hill, your temple. People are looking down on us, God. They are looking down on your city. Remember, these people are yours. Daniel had no doubt poured over the two prophecies in the book of Jeremiah, suggesting that God's people would be in exile for 70 years. He also recognized that the 70 year period was coming to a close. And, you know, as you look back and you, you, you see the experience of Daniel. Think of all that he's been through, his childhood and, and, and in there in Israel, and be taken as a, a teenager probably to Babylon, getting that education and rising in such a high position of Babylon, and then being, you know, being, Babylon being conquered by Medo-Persia. Now Daniel is one of the leaders over there in Medo-Persia. And How yet- How many times has that happened? Yeah, exactly. A leader in one nation conquered by another and now he's leader in a new nation yep amazing stuff and yet his concern is still about his basically his, his homeland way back there in, from his childhood daniel also knew that up to that point jerusalem lay in complete ruins nothing but a heap of rubble Having read the books of Moses, he recognized it was God's original plan that Jerusalem should be the capital of his people and it should have been an example to all the nations. But what an example it had become. I mean, you know, suppose you were one of the Samaritans at that point in time and you, you travel over there to have a look at what's left of Jerusalem as nothing but a pile of rubble. And what are you going to say? Their God must have been a farce. Yep. That's what they thought. Yeah. If, you know, I mean, if, 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 if Jerusalem's God was anything, the temple would still be there, the yep. city would still be there, the people would still be there. Yeah, the fact that Assyria had conquered part of the land, that Babylon came and conquered it three times, clearly the God of Jerusalem is powerless. He's nothing compared to these other gods. That was their idea. If one nation conquers another nation, that means that the conquering nation's God is more powerful, better than the, than the nation that got conquered. Well, Daniel was also, no doubt, aware of the blessings and curses pronounced in Deuteronomy 28 and 29. And then he recognized that many of those curses had been fulfilled because the, his people had turned away from him. And look at Deuteronomy 4, 27 to 31. Uh, I think we have time to look at that real quick. The Lord will scatter you among other nations where only a few of you will survive. How, what percentage of the Israelites came home to Jerusalem? One or two percent. One or two percent. There you will serve gods made by human hands, gods of wood and stone, gods that cannot see or hear, eat or smell. There you will look for the Lord your God and, your, and if you search for him with all your heart, you will find him. When you're in trouble and all those things happen to you, then you will finally turn to the Lord and obey Him. He is a merciful God. He will not abandon you or destroy you, and He will not forget the covenant that He Himself made with your ancestors. Daniel, no doubt, knew about the siege that had affected Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel, of course, was taken away with the first time Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem. He, he wasn't there when Nebuchadnezzar came the third time and just flattened the place. Nebuchadnezzar camped around that city for almost three years. Things became desperate and those curses that had been prophesied by Moses back in Deuteronomy 28, 53 to 57 were fulfilled. And, and this is talking about parents eating their children. It's talking about children snatching food out of the mouths of their parents. Mother, women giving birth to a child, eating the child and eating the afterbirth. I mean, it's just crazy. 
Israel had become a reproach, a disgrace, instead of the noble city it was supposed to be. It's interesting that immediately following that noble prayer by Daniel, he was given the prophecy in Daniel 9, 24 to 27, spelling out the future history of the children of Israel down to the time that Jerusalem would be destroyed again. So here he's, he's reviewing the history. He's been talking about it and everything, and he's talking about, okay, all, here's all the things we did wrong, and now look at the mess we're in. And so what does God say? It's not over. <laughs> Let me tell you what's coming in the future. Okay, so Daniel 9, 24 to 27. I guess that's mine. Seven times 70 years is the length of time God has set for freeing your people and your holy city from, this, from sin and evil. Sin will be forgiven and eternal justice established so that the vision and the prophecy will come true and the holy temple will be rededicated. Notice this, note this and understand it. From the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem until God's chosen leader comes, seven times seven years will pass. Jerusalem will be rebuilt with streets and strong defenses and will stand for seven times 62 years, but this will be a time of troubles. And at the end of that time, God's chosen leader will be killed unjustly. And who was the chosen leader? Jesus. Jesus. The city and the temple will be destroyed by the invading army of a powerful ruler. The end will come like a flood, bringing the war and destruction which God has prepared. I mean, if you sit down and you calculate this all out and you look at all the historical records, it it is amazing how precisely, I mean, you can, you can nail it. I mean, just every, there's a whole bunch of prophecies. You stack all the prophecies together again and again and again and again. Everything fits exactly. That ruler will have a firm agreement with many people for seven years, and when half this time has passed, he will put an end to sacrifices and offerings. And how did he put an end to sacrifices and offerings? Jesus himself died. Jesus himself died, and what happened at that time? The temple curtain was ripped from top to bottom. Okay. The awful whore will be placed on the highest point of the temple and will remain there until the one who put it there meets the end which God has prepared for him. And they actually brought in a statue of Zeus, or they built one or something like that. Anyway. Daniel had just been praying about Israel's past and present, and then he was given a, few, a view of Israel's future. And what about us? Seventh-day Adventists, are we in some degree in the same position that the ancient Israelites were? During the world, uh, does the world look at us as a light set on the hill and praise God? Where does that idea come from? Matthew 5, 16. Don't hide your lamp under a, burn, under a bush or what are you supposed to do? Let everyone see it and praise God. Are we spreading the truth of Scripture, especially the three angels' messages of Revelation 14, 6 through 12, successfully to the world? I wonder how long it's been since you've heard a powerful Adventist preacher stand up in public and talk about the three angels' messages. If you were living in the days of Daniel... And yet the three angels are the emblem of our church. Yes. We say that's, the, that's what we're telling the world about. Yep. Well, if you were living in the days of Daniel and you read the book of Deuteronomy and you knew all that had happened to the children of Israel and to Jerusalem, how would you feel? You mean we were told this? Yes. Well, look what happened in the days of Josiah, yeah. which was just a little while before this. And his children, Josiah's children, were much worse even than the, their ancestors. Okay, as a Seventh-day Adventist living in the 21st century and reading the prophecies in Scripture, especially, especially Daniel and Revelation, and the writings of Ellen White, how should we feel? I mean, how much, how much light do we have? How much inspired records do we have? How should we respond when we read that we should have been in the kingdom of God before this? Jim? Adventists, after the great disappointment in 1844, held fast, their faith followed, or unitedly on, excuse me, held fast their faith and followed on unitedly in the opening providence of God, 
receiving the message of the third angel and in the power of the Holy Spirit proclaiming it to the world. They would have seen the salvation of God. The Lord would have wrought mightily with their efforts. The work would have been completed and Christ would have come ere this to receive his people to their reward. In the period of doubt and uncertainty that follows the disappointment, many of the Advent believers yielded their faith. Thus the work was hindered and the world was left in darkness. Had the whole Adventist body united upon the commandments in, a, in God and the faith of Jesus, how widely different would have been our history. Now let's stop for just a second and, and fill that story out. She's talking about all those Adventists, the William Miller followers, etc. How many Adventists survived the Great Disappointment? Very few. About maybe 5% or something like that. She's saying if all those people back there had followed on and learned about the Sabbath and started keeping the Sabbath and presented the message that we're talking about now, we would have been in the kingdom. This was written in 1883. Okay, That's go ahead. a couple years ago. A uh, few. It was not the will of God that the coming of, the Christ, of Christ should be thus delayed. God did not design that his people, Israel, should wander 40 years in the wilderness. He promised to lead them directly to the land of Canaan and establish them there a holy, healthy, happy people. But those to whom he, it was first preached went not in because of unbelief. Their hearts were filled and with murmuring, rebellion, and hatred, and he would not fulfill his covenant with them. For 40 years did unbelief, murmuring, and rebellion shut out ancient Israel from the land of Canaan. The same sins have delayed the entrance of modern Israel into the heavenly Canaan. Oh, what, what sins are those? Same old, same old. Unbelief, lack of faith, in other words, murmuring and rebellion have kept us out of what? The heavenly Canaan. The heavenly Canaan. In neither case were the promises of God at fault. It is the unbelief, worldliness, unconsecration, and strife among the Lord's professed people that have kept us in this world of sin and sorrow so many years. Manuscript 4, 1883. Wow. Does this sound at all like some of the words the ancient prophets said to Israel? Yeah. A little bit, maybe? Hard to tell the difference. <laughs> wow. It should not be surprising to us that the five books of Moses, beginning with Genesis down to Deuteronomy, would be read and prayed about by subsequent biblical writers. We would expect them to repeat ideas from the stories of creation, the fall, the flood, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, etc. We would also expect them to talk about events that happened in connection with the deliverance from Egypt and wandering the wilderness for 40 years. This lesson has focused on several main points that, it, that happened in the subsequent years. The reformation of Josiah that we talked about and the lessons from that faithful leader. Unfortunately, what happened to Josiah? Do you remember? Yeah, he got the idea that he should go and fight the Egyptian king the Egyptian, and he was killed. The Egyptian the king was on his way up to fight with the Hittites and some other people up north. He was just passing by and Josiah suddenly decided without consulting the Lord, as good as he'd been, he decided to rush out there and stop this Egyptian king from going by through part of his territory and got himself killed. The prayer of Nehemiah we've talked about, more deep truths based on revival and reformation. The prayer of Daniel, mourning for loss. The religion of Micah, on what true religion, on what true religion really means. So let's just review our lessons quickly in what few minutes we have left. Many years later, we come to the story of Ezra and Nehemiah. A very small percentage, perhaps 1 to 2 percent of the children of Israel, had returned to Judah and Jerusalem and were trying to restore things. They had already rebelled by marrying heathen women from the nations around them. But Nehemiah was determined to correct that problem. In cooperation with Ezra, they determined that one of the things that needed to happen was for the people to hear once again the word of God. Carrie? Uh, I got lost there. Sorry. Right at the top. 
Well, right up, I'm looking at the bottom here to match it up. Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 4 through 8. Ezra was standing on a wooden platform that had been built for the occasion. The following men stood at his right. And let's, let's just skip the names. You don't have to pronounce all those names. And then the other men said a whole bunch of them, a, a dozen of them. Okay, jump to the next paragraph. As Ezra, as Ezra rather, stood there on the platform high above the people, they all kept their eyes fixed on him. As soon as he opened the book, they all stood up. Ezra said, Praise the Lord, the great God. Uh, let's interrupt for a second here and say, the whole a huge group of them, I don't know if it was really all the people of Israel, but a huge group of them came. And they stood there, and there was a platform built up, and Ezra was standing above the platform, and he's saying, people, we need to know God's word. You haven't heard it. There's all sorts of variations. Let's read. Let's see what God actually said to us. Okay? All the people raised their arms in the air and answered, Amen, Amen. They knelt in worship with their faces to the ground. Then they rose and stood in their places, and the following Levites explained the law to them. And a bunch of names again. Okay. They gave an oral translation. And in brackets it says, The law was written in Hebrew, but in Babylonia the Jews had adopted Aramaic as the language for the daily life. They were forced to speak Aramaic. Okay. Well, because of this, a translation was necessary of God's law and explained it so that people could understand it from the Good News Bible. Okay. There was a great reformation that took place because the people heard the Bible explained to them in a language that they could understand. This was the first modern speech or modern language translation of the scriptures. Oh dear. Today, many conservative Christians still want to go back more than 400 years to idolize the King James Version of the Bible. In fact, few of them could read it if they had it in the original language. Shouldn't we follow the example of Nehemiah and Ezra and read the scriptures in a modern language? What would happen if we tried to settle model, model, modern prob problems the way they did in ancient times? Let me let you think about that, and I'll think about that. That's God's plan for us. Let's pray. Our wonderful Father, we thank you for these insights from Scripture. We thank you for the words of people like Nehemiah and Josiah, and especially the writings of Moses how many lessons we could learn from them if we studied that we had time to study them and spell them out in great detail. Thank you for this opportunity to worship you as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.